You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast, so sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Brandon, you're back in Canberra, I pre- presume. Yep, I am indeed. Back in yep. Canberra. We uh, last week. It's sunny Canberra. Yeah, if, if people are not aware, last week we Brandon was down in Melbourne and we did a, a live video podcast. So uh, if you haven't seen that, go check it out. But that was a lot of fun. It's always good to um good to do those podcasts. We'll have to uh I'll have to as I said last week, we'll have to I'll have to come up to, to you Canberra. You keep saying it. I know. Well, <laughs> you keep well, saying well, it. Don't don't you? You? <laughs> <laughs> when's yeah. it gonna turn into reality? Hey, when, hey. when's it gonna happen? No, but no I, you're, I, you're I, absolutely right. Uh, last week, I, it's just so much better <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when yeah. it's in person. It's just so much more flowing. It's it's so easy. It's just mm. it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and maybe it helps that I'm also in Melbourne, so I kind of feel like I'm on holidays a little bit. So maybe yeah. <laughs> maybe that helps bring bring my mood up or something. But <laughs> yeah, well, it, <laughs> no, I had a great time. It was a really good podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as you're you know settled into, I know you've, you're in the new office now, so mm, and it's kind yep. of it's always a bit chaotic at the start of the year. I always find I need a few weeks to kind of. Just get mm. things grounded. As soon as we're we're both ready for that, I'll I'll jet up. Maybe early yeah. February or something like that. Well, hopefully that's not too far away. I remember we were talking about this end of last year, and mm. because I wanted to have this office space set up by the end of December. Right. Jeez, how how wrong that was. I've just gotten delivery, so I was supposed to get delivery of all my furniture mid December. Right, and then some half of the furniture has only just arrived. I got wow. more of it coming I think in the next couple of weeks and then also some timber paneling that I'm going to use to build part of the set is also not coming until like another month so it's just, it's just and funnily enough like we talk about this every week I should have probably anticipated it <laughs> but it's all because of supply chain issues yeah. or you know COVID lockdowns like for example there was a delay in the manufacture of the furniture and then there was also a delay in the availability of the shipping company to ship the furniture from Melbourne to Canberra wow. so, yeah, it's all happening. Yeah, but, uh, anything that needs to be shipped overseas at the moment is going to be either more expensive or it's going to take a really long time. <laughs> That's yeah, what I found with furniture. But la- even last year, I was trying to get a bunch of furniture and it just, everything was taking so long. Yeah. So. so, now I'm feeling that. <laughs> but yes, hopefully, now, hopefully, uh, maybe in a few more weeks, it, it might be looking a little bit better. But yeah, it'd be great to have you come up to Canberra and, and, uh, and hang out and Mm. Come uh, experience the new office. You could record a video here. That'd yeah, be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, today we've got a big story we'll talk about probably maybe yes. s- a little bit into the podcast. Microsoft has made a massive move in the gaming space buying uh, Activision Blizzard. Got a couple other things to talk about. What else have we got? Instagram to uh, trial a subscription model. That'll be interesting to, to talk yeah. about. Some more inflation numbers, not out of the US this time, but of course, we all ha- always have to include uh, our our daily or weekly talk on inflation. <laughs> 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 and uh, The Young Inflation yeah. Podcast. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> we can just temporarily change the name to that for like the next yeah. couple of years because that's, that's what it's, it's going to be. What, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, All right. Should we get straight into it? Today's episode yeah, is sponsored by ShareSite, which is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So basically, you can bring in all of your trades either automatically by connecting to your broker, or you can do it manually one by one or by downloading all of your trades from your broker into an Excel spreadsheet and copying it over whichever way you want to do it. And once you do that, it will track all of the different types of gains and losses in your portfolio. So capital gains, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans on say an index fund, it will do all of those calculations for you, which is a lifesaver. 
currency gains if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies. That's a big one at the moment. Well, with changes in inflation and interest rates, there's going to be big changes in currency exchange between different countries. So that is something you definitely want to be tracking. And then you can also use it for when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 12 different reports that can be used at tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. At the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That site spelled S-I-G-H sharesite.com forward slash young investors. Use that link, sign up to a free plan, track up to 10 holdings, or you can also use that link to sign up to a paid plan and get four months off a yearly subscription if you're interested. So go check it out. Absolutely. Hey, um, before we got into anything, you know how last week we were talking about how much uh, how much cash would you need, income, net worth, that kind of oh, thing yeah. to feel rich? Mm. Yeah. I've got an update because I did, uh, I put the call out and said, I'd like to hear from you guys, you know? Um, and we actually had quite a few people uh, sending us uh, comments talking about what they would what they would need to generate income wise, net worth wise mm. to feel rich. That was the question, right? Yeah. Uh, it was to whether, whether you feel rich. Um, so James said uh, income of 250,000 per year or a $5 million net worth. Um, mm-hmm. Chicken Dipper <laughs> was surprised <laughs> on, uh, was surprised on the high side saying income of a hundred thousand would be a uh, sufficient net worth of one to 1.5 million. Uh, but also brought up the point that obviously it very much depends on, on where you live. Mm. I thought that was a good point to bring up. Uh, MB had uh, some perspective from Italy saying 40,000 to 50,000 euro per year net. So after tax, mm. uh, also Luca said in Italy, 1 million euro, uh, is sufficient or 40,000 euro per year. Uh, Emmanuel said 100,000 per year. Joey said $500,000 per year income to be rich. Marco said a million dollars per year. So I thought this was interesting because it shows that there's a lot of variation, isn't there? So yeah, um, it just shows. I, I yeah. was kind of I was kind of imagining that people would settle it at around a range, and my range might have been like maybe $100,000, $200,000 a year. Um, but it is interesting how much that uh, that varies, and I guess. Um, a lot of these guys brought up the point that, yeah, it, it very much depends on where you live because that will have a big impact on how much your life costs per year and how much you therefore have to make to feel comfortable. So, Yeah, yeah, exactly right. There's just so many people have so many different experiences, people living in different areas, growing up with different kinds of wealth. And I think all of those things kind of factor into your perception of, of what would be a lot compared to kind of what you have now. Um, so yeah, it is interesting to see so much variation, but, uh, not really surprised, I guess, by the fact that there's a lot of variation that makes sense. Mm. Everyone is kind of different and has different experiences. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thanks everyone for for, for participating and sending in the comments. So it was interesting to to hear from you guys. Mm. Um, all right, Hamish, tell me what's going on. Yeah, talk, what's going on let, in the world of the markets? Yeah, let's talk about the markets because yeah, I mean, I just saw a headline this morning that said the Nasdaq is officially in a correction, which I I don't know. Like, yeah, that surprised me. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> it always catches me by surprise because I don't really I kind of watch stop my portfolio, you know, over a couple of days, maybe a couple of times a week, but I don't really focus on the big indices all that much. Like I'm not really tracking it day by day, but the NASDAQ- Do you remember when we used yeah. to do that week by week? We used to start by saying what yeah. was happening in the indices. <laughs> totally irrelevant to the type of investing that we do, but we we used to do it. Yeah, it was completely <laughs> pointless. But <laughs> yeah. No, but um, yeah, so the NASDAQ is now down 11% from its November high. So, um, okay. yeah, rocky start to, I guess, the end of last year and and the start of this year. Uh, but I wanted to sort of draw on the S&P 500, which is now down about 5% from its highs. But last year, I mean, it had an amazing year. It was up over 25%, I think about 27%, if, if I'm not wrong, or 28% mm, maybe, including, something like that, including yeah. dividends. Um, so that kind of, you know, raises a question of, well, first of all, that's a massive year and you could say, wow, that's a, that's a lot more than, you know, the average year. If you look back over the S and P over a hundred years and you're more, you know, expecting something more in line of seven, 8% on average, um, so you can look at the S and P returns in that respect, but you could also think of it as, you know, how, how can we tell if it's deserved? And the way that I think about it is the market will generally be influenced by two things. 
really. You can look at over two dimensions. One would be the increasing or decreasing profits of the businesses, right? So if the profits right, of yeah. businesses go up, then their values should go up generally. Um, Makes sense, yeah. And vice versa. And then also coupled with the price that investors are willing to pay for those profits. So the price to earnings ratio, for example, right? So just to give you an mm. example, profits might go up 10% in a year, but if the market increases 15%, then that kind of shows you that investors have you know positive expectations of the market going into the next year, that investors right. are willing to pay even more than than just the increase in, in profits. So that um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to think of kind of a year, we can look back over a year and, and kind of view the S&P 500 through that lens. Um, and uh, the actually the opposite of that example is what happened last year for the S&P 500. So even though it was up 28% last year, corporate earnings actually went up for the S&P 500, 49% which is quite astounding. So, in fact, for every 1% increase in profit, the market only went up half a percent. There wasn't a one-for-one increase in prices to... Um, to to increases in earnings, um, so that's interesting. It, yeah, it, it actually brings things back into perspective because initially, if you just look at twenty eight percent increase over a year, you just think, "Wow, that's massive." That's the market insane. is very very positive about companies going into the next year. But if you compare that to f- a fifty percent increase in earnings, you could actually think of it as the market being quite pessimistic relative to the increase in earnings, or at least being less optimistic than they have been in, in previous years, um, where you know you go back to 2020 and the market went up a ton, even though earnings were down. So, um, bring so is, this, perspective. Yeah. is this a, an outcome of, I'm just trying to think through, is, is, so is this an outcome of... Uh, stock uh, stock values or market caps being very, very high for where they should have been last year. And now that we've seen kind of, I guess, a rebound um, from the COVID times, I guess, mm. corporate earnings have kind of jumped back up. Is this kind of the earnings catching up, I suppose, or growing into the the prices that investors had put on the companies in the prior years. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You could see it. Right. It could definitely be that, right? Because we've seen, I mean, we've for many years prior to 2021, uh, for the last few years, um, we've seen the S&P 500 price go up faster than its earnings, right? We've seen that price to earnings ratio yeah. for the S&P 500 expand pretty much every single year for the past few years as investors have been more and more positive about the markets. Um, this is the first year in a long time that that was not the case, um, bringing down price to earnings um, ratio for the S&P 500. Um, right. And uh, the article that was talking about um, S&P 500 earnings and, and, and um, how that compared to the increases last year uh, basically indicated that this is likely because a lot investors are expecting there to be much more challenges going into 2022 than there were in 2021. <laughs> yeah, and right. they listed okay, a yeah. number of things that we've spoken about a lot of times um, on this <laughs> podcast. Interest rate increases, which will, of course, have two effects on companies. One is higher debt payments if they have debt, and it also Mm. hurts valuations. Um, Labor shortages uh, due to high consumer demand, um, which will drive lower profit margins for companies. And then, of course, the other supply chain issues, shipping and freight, um, is many times more expensive at the moment than it usually is. So, all of these things are going to make, um, well, are expected to make companies um, make uh, profits this year much more challenging than last year. Mm. And that's what investors are expecting. Um, so yeah, it kind of put, I just thought it was an interesting thing to, to kind of look at because it's easy to look at 27% and say, wow, the market is crazy, but actually in perspective to how earnings rose, it was much more reasonable. Um, I mean, if investors had the same expectations as, as previous years, you, we could have seen a 50% increase in the S and P 500 last year in line Mm. with earnings. So, um, interesting, interesting stuff. I wonder how much. This is just a question that I don't know the answer to that <laughs> that is that may make a big difference. I wonder how much of like uh, how much debt of all these different companies, how much is like at a fixed rate and how much is at a variable rate? 
yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, oh, except no. that I know that there are a lot of companies that use very, very short term loans um, to, to, right. to run their business. I mean, oh, yes. it's extremely common for businesses to have a lot of money in two to five year bonds of mm. two to five year notes and uh, they just renew them with new with new debt as the debt oh, comes see, through. So, you know, so in that respect- So, the kind of turnover, right, as interest rates rise, that kind of turning over of, of, of the bonds is what hurts them. Yes, exactly. And, and that's what's concerning about businesses that are loaded up on debt and actually don't have the ability to, or have an interest in paying down that debt, like that they don't care about paying down that debt. They just expect mm. that they can take new yeah. debt and pay it off and then take new debt and pay off the old debt. And um, that makes that's sense. okay see, yeah. while interest rates are low, uh, but as interest rates rise, that becomes more and more challenging. Whereas you have other businesses that use debt and have the ability to pay it off um, or intend on paying that off over a couple of years. Yeah. Um, there's two distinct strategies there. And then there's just companies that are, you know, not even profitable and they are completely reliant on debt. And those companies will um, struggle first when uh, or if interest rates continue to, to rise. So... That makes sense. So, even though most of the debt might be, say, at a fixed rate, if it's a, mm. if it's in the form of a, of a bond or something like that, it's the fact that it's the short term, it's going to be paid back, but then they'll also have to create a new one potentially at a higher interest rate. That's what's going to hurt them. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like, I mean, at the moment, I mean, particularly in Australia, if you're looking at a mortgage, I mean, there's so many mortgages that have extremely low interest rates, but it's like a two-year fixed period. So, yes. you know, you're, yeah, looking at yeah. a, you're looking at it a very low likely looking at an increase after that two-year period, even if it's, you know, 1.8% for a year or one or 2.2% for two or three years or something like that. Yeah. After that, um, we, we really don't know what we're going to see in, in two to three years in terms of interest rates. So, yeah. Well, I guess that's what, <laughs> if you want to get into another topic, that's what causes housing collapses is that people en masse don't really realize what they've signed up to <laughs> yeah it's the whole yeah sure fix it look you can get a two inch two percent interest rate fix for two years and then it'll go to variable after that but interest rates are low right they go oh okay i sign up <laughs> yeah and i mean and then two years later and interest rates have gone up by five percent and they're like uh oh <laughs> yeah and with housing affordability being at a <laughs> crisis level at the moment in in yeah. major cities in australia you can't you'd have to imagine there's a lot of young people who have gotten into the property market with low interest rates um yeah. but maybe stretch themselves may, to do so exactly so um yeah we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens not to be too pessimistic mm. it's, it's still <laughs> 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 the sky is falling hamish um okay oh, so that was interesting um very interesting story uh should we should we leave that one there and get into the big the big boy for this it. week let's do it what happened All right Microsoft. Um, Microsoft acquired or is is planning to, they didn't do it, they are planning to acquire uh, Activision Blizzard. So, wow. Microsoft announced Tuesday it will buy video game giant Activision Blizzard in a $68.7 billion all cash deal. Um, the price means Microsoft will pay $95 per share for Activision. Um, Activision's stock ended the day up more than 25%, <laughs> closing at $82.31 per share on Tuesday. Microsoft shares closed down a little more than 2%. Uh, this would be Microsoft's largest acquisition to date, followed uh, by its purchase of LinkedIn in 2016 for $26.2 billion. Wow. Activision, which is known for popular games such as Call of Duty and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, has been caught up in controversy uh, for the last several months after reports of sexual misconduct and harassment among the company's executives. On Monday, Activision said it fired dozens of executives following an investigation. And for those that don't know, um, the reports, are, I've been following it a little bit, but the reports of the sexual harassment um, in Activision Blizzard have sent the stock down uh, 38% from their high in wow. February 2021. So, a considerable chunk of their value has been uh, has been wiped out over the past year or so. Um, and I guess the, the first thing that I, I, I thought of when I saw this, um, and I, I should say I definitely don't mean to downplay or dismiss the reports of the sexual harassment and that sort of thing, but I, I'm thinking purely from uh, Microsoft's standpoint, from an acquisition point of view. Um, you know, I thought this was smart from Microsoft because they'll be able to pounce because they're, they're in the mode of trying to acquire video game 
companies at the moment, video mm. game developers. So I thought this is smart. They'll be able to pounce on yet another video game company and they could possibly get it really cheap because of the fact that all these internal issues have caused the stock price to tank a lot. Um, but then after reading the article, they're they're paying a 46% <laughs> premium yeah. on the stock. Yeah, it's a massive premium. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I mean, I'm surprised. I'm surprised the stock's only at 82. Like, why is it not at 94? Not <laughs> I think it's because um, there's there's still a little bit of like it, it hasn't been finalized. The deal's not actually set in stone. Right. And there are people that are worried that um, I think that the government might have something to say Lock on it. this one um, to do with the monopoly forming kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so I think that's why they're not. Because, yeah, you would imagine if you knew it was going to go through, the price would pretty much be exactly right. Mm. Um, it did, that's a really good example, I think, of of why believing that markets are always efficient is kind of ridiculous because this is an example of where you can't possibly correctly price Activision Blizzard's stock price with the uncertainty of this acquisition, right? Like, how do you, mm. is it, is it 85? Like, what's the, do you, do you have to factor in a specific percentage chance that the acquisition goes through and then yeah. factor that into a, a, a discount to the $95 per share? Because if it was a certainty, it would be 95 or well, just a little bit below given um, cost of trading, right? So, yeah. but given that it's not certain, what, where, where do you price it, right? Like, there's, there's no way for you to, to know what is the correct price for Activision Blizzard stock right now, given the uncertainty. So, I think this is a good example of how, um, you know, even in a situation of an acquisition that is a dollar amount for the company, mm. it's just you, you can't reach. Th- there's no publicly available information that can tell you what the stock should be worth y- if it was like mm. completely efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So, I thought this was really interesting. Um yeah, I, I thought that, you know, just reading this, I was like, oh, Microsoft, here we go. They're just going to jump in while the share price is low. Easy acquisition opportunity. Won't have mm. to pay that much. And then I see that they pay a 46% premium on the stock. So, I'm like, wow, okay. Um, and obviously, I'm no expert, definitely not on mergers and acquisitions, but it did seem, that seems like a high premium. But I, I didn't actually know... I didn't know like what is the average merger and acquisition kind of premium. Mm. Um, so I kind of went and I had a look um, at a couple. Well, uh, it's, it's a little bit old this data, but I found this is a report from Deloitte um, for U.S. companies in 2014 to 2016. The average acquisition premium was 38 percent. Okay. And in 2017 to 2019, that rose to 55%. Right. 55%. Yeah. That's as high. a premium. Just and I, I mean I guess it does make sense. For those that are wondering why why these companies even have to pay a premium, they they always pay a premium because um, they are buying a controlling stake in the company. They're buying the whole thing. And obviously, uh, a controlling stake in a company is going to cost a lot more than what we do when we buy a couple of shares, which is obviously a non-controlling stake. So, there's always a premium to pay when you want to take over the whole company. Um, at 55%. Holy moly. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that that bad. Yeah. But the crazy thing is, and I'll actually uh, just quickly go back to this website, um, for non-US deals, non-US, 2014 to 2016, the um, acquisition premium was 12%. Wow. And in 2017 to 2019, it was 15%. <laughs> So, looking wow. at 55% versus 15%, whether or not you're in the US. How crazy is that? that? Is, that's insane. Yeah, it's crazy. And I mean, Activision stock price was at 57 not too long ago, which is a mm. long way from what they're purchasing it at. You yeah, have, absolutely. They should have just started buying. They should have just bought some in the open market. <laughs> yeah, why not? Just try and... Uh, what's it? Hostile takeover? Yeah. Is that just when you try and force... <laughs> force you just try and buy as many shares as you can yeah (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah a very very interesting but uh that gives me a little bit of context so maybe a 46 percent premium on the stock isn't actually that too far out of the normal realms although it still still seems like a lot and and i mean (laughs) it is below where the stock was a year ago Uh, six months ago actually even yeah you know and maybe the strategy was you know okay if we apply a 
a, a standard premium percentage to the stock now, then we will still get a discount on where it was, which is what p- potentially what they believe the business's operations to actually be worth. Mm. Um, and the, I guess the allegation, the uh, the reports of sexual harassment has helped it get down to a level where wh- when they apply the premium, it's like they don't have to pay a premium anymore. So mm. maybe that's part of the strategy um, as well. But uh, yeah, it says here, Microsoft said it expects to close the deal in fiscal 2023. However, US regulators have signaled they will be far more aggressive in evaluating large acquisitions, especially in the tech industry. So there's a chance the deal dies under government review. Um, Microsoft has gotten more and more aggressive uh, with gaming over the past several years. It bought Minecraft Maker Mojang for $2.5 billion in 2014. And last year, Microsoft completed a $7.5 billion acquisition of game maker Bethesda. Mm. Um, and I guess that's the second big thing I wanted to bring up when it came to this story. Um, this really does show that Microsoft is hell bent on forming some sort of video game monopoly. They really want to just own all the video games. <laughs> yeah, it, it is interesting because, yeah, I don't know. It, gaming is a it's a very difficult industry because you have, I mean, Activision Blizzard leans quite heavily on these these franchises that they've had for for a really long time. Um, you can imagine that, I guess, just rinse and repeating franchises that have worked in the past is probably easier than developing new games that have the chance yep. of, of not having success. But um, yeah, it, I, I would find it very difficult to judge the value of, of a game franchise like Call of Duty, for example. I, I would find mm. that so difficult to judge um, and how that's going to change over time. Will people always just play Call of Duty? Will this go for another 10 years? I mean, it's already been going for, what, 20 years or something like that. Maybe, mm. I don't know when the first one came out, but um, like how long does that franchise have um, how, of life? I don't know. I don't know the answer yeah. to that question. Or maybe the strategy is to just acquire the talent. So, just acquire mm. the the make the makers and then under Microsoft's control, they can say, okay, we're forming a monopoly because we own most of the video game makers out there, mm. the studios. So, maybe we can now point the finger and say, you will make this, you will make that. Um so I guess they maybe they're looking at a monopoly in that way, but they're definitely. I mean, they just want to make. They're they're essentially trying to make the Netflix of video games with their Microsoft Game Pass. So they're definitely trying mm. to turn gaming into a subscription model. Um, and I think that they would have just done the sums internally. They just would have said, "Look, this is what um, this is what we can we, we're making at the moment." on our Game Pass subscription, if we acquire these titles, then we'll also we'll probably be able to make this amount. So, it must just work out. Because for those that don't know, I mean, Activision Blizzard makes a lot of games. So, the, the, the um, article just said, oh, they make Call of Duty and Tony Hawk Pro Skater. But that's just like the Activision side. So, I think Activision, they make uh, Call of Duty, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, Crash Bandicoot, and Skylanders. But then when you look at the Blizzard side of things, they make World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, Overwatch, Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm. These are all incredibly popular franchises. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, and they've got a lot, a lot of players on some of those franchises. So, uh, fr- franchises. So, I think that this is uh, very strategic from Microsoft um, and we'll see what happens, I guess. Mm, recurring revenue is the... <laughs> is the uh, oh, everything uh, subscription model. Yeah, everything at the moment. The last five years, just everything has gone subscription mm. model. Um, My dental floss is on a subscription <laughs> model. <laughs> it is crazy though. I mean, you get ads for, for all kinds of things that you get now, just like subscription box, even like coffee mm. is on a subscription model now. If, you, if you're if you a coffee drinker, you'll get coffee beans in a box that come every yeah. month. Like everything is subscription model. It's just like, it's like everyone's yep. realized how valuable, how powerful, how powerful it is. Um, it's, yep. it's crazy. Shaving as well. There's the one where it sends you new razors every yep. month or whatever. Yeah, it Dollar is. Shave yeah. Club or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, crazy stuff. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. They've definitely figured out the the secret. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, everyone's trying to do it. Mm. In other so, uh, we are going to be starting the Young Investors Podcast subscription model. So, we are actually now going to put the podcast behind a paywall and you guys will have to pay $10 a month. To li- no. <laughs> That's one way to kill our. <laughs> I would. I would never do that. Jeez. <laughs> no, that would be a terrible idea. Terrible, that would be terrible, a very terrible. bad idea. The only very, subscription very you need 
is ShareSite. ShareSite.com. <laughs> Just rerun the ad and it's time for an ad break. Did you know? ShareSite.com. No. And we're doing it again. No. In, yeah. in other acquisition news though, I've got another acquisition uh, that uh, oh, really? occurred this week. Monster Beverage is uh, moving into the alcohol market. This is just a quick story. I don't have really? too much to kind of talk on this, but uh, the Monster Beverage, of course, is the company whose revenue primarily comes from Monster Energy. Um, yes. The, uh, actually the largest energy drink brand in the world um, in front of Red Bull. They have acquired Kanaki Craft Brewery Collective. That's a cool name. It's like Can- That is pretty cool. C-A-N with capitals and then- Arky, Kanaki for $330 million. So massive acquisition in the beverage industry. And uh, they made an all cash deal. Monster Beverage is um, always very cashed up, always has a great balance sheet. So they can take advantage of, of opportunities like this um, with cash. They don't have to dilute shareholders or even take on any debt, which is fantastic. Right. Um, and uh, this comes after a number of other moves in the beverage, the non-alcoholic beverage space, moving into the alcoholic beverage space. So you have, oh, um, okay. you have Coca-Cola, which made a deal with Constellation Brands, which is, um, I think, I think one of the biggest alcohol companies in um, the US. Um, right. And then you had PepsiCo, who didn't acquire but partnered with Boston Beer uh, to launch an alcoholic Mountain Dew drink. I don't know. Wow. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's like Mountain Dew and vodka or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. That just does not sound like something I would want to drink. But anyway. <laughs> there you go. I can't even remember the last time I had Mountain Dew. It's a long time no. ago. I remember it was all the rage when I was going through like primary school and high school. Everyone would drink Mountain Dew. I never got around it though. No. What's your favorite? Do you have a favorite fizzy drink or you don't really drink fizzy drinks? <sighs> not really. Just Coke, really. Just, right, just, okay. just Coke. Um, yeah. I'm a Pepsi Max boy myself. Oh, you're not, are you? I am. <sighs> I think we're going to have to end the podcast here, guys. Thanks. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. i tell you why. Because I drink uh, zero sugar fizzy drinks. Mm. And trust me, Pepsi Max is a million times better than Coke no sugar. I have to disagree with you there. I have to disagree with you. No, nah, it's a million times better. Hamish, don't even try me, mate. <laughs> Are we going to start beefing? Is this our first ever fight? I think this is, yeah, I think... <laughs> This is this is this is um, a okay, big drama okay. here. Forget forget <laughs> about how much money you need to be to to feel rich. You need to go. <laughs> to, we need your help. We need to settle this beef. Okay. <laughs> Head over to the to the podcast on uh, on YouTube and leave us a comment. Pepsi Max or Coke No Sugar or Diet Coke. Hmm. Diet Pepsi di- Max. Di- Pepsi, di- I already Coke know. Is, no. I already know. Pepsi Max has got it in the bag. No, no chance. Trust me. No chance. Trust me. Watch it happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, sorry, I completely ruined your story there. Um, back on track. Oh yeah. Here we also, go. we can add to that. <laughs> if you want an alcoholic Mountain Dew, then you can you can say that as well. We'll, we'll take that as a as a vote in that in that debate yeah. as well. But <laughs> I don't I don't think anybody's going to say that. No, I don't think so, but you never know. Um, anyway. anyway, so now Monster controls a, a basket of, of alcoholic drink brands, not any that I personally know, to be honest. They must be um, all, uh, I, I think they're all American brands. Um, Cigar City, uh, Oscar Blues, Deep Ellum, Perrin Brewing, Squatters, and Wasatch. So, Jeez, they got some weird names, don't they? I don't know. it. Do you know any of those? I don't know. A, no, I don't. No. No. Yeah, no. so... Um, there you go. That's all. That's, all, that's go. all I had for uh, for that. Just uh, small. Well, it's a big acquisition for Monster Beverage, but kind of small news in the scale of uh, acquisition week, which was uh, mm. kind of overcast by Microsoft's big. And move. it's interesting that these beverage companies are moving like into alcohol now. It's yeah. It's kind of like I wonder who started it. it seems to be like a bit of a trend, but. I guess we'll see what happens with it in the future. Yeah, yeah, um, it, it is interesting to see. I, I don't know all, all too much about kind of the moves that these um, these soft drink makers are, are making. Boston Beer, which is um, one of the companies that made a deal with uh, PepsiCo, has been really riding a wave of the popularity of um, alcoholic seltzers over the past three mm. or four or five years, um, which is actually starting to come off for them. Um, they're actually starting to see some having some trouble with that. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting space. The alcohol industry has these kind of staples that are s- consistent over time.
time. But then there's these bursts of trends that that come up as well. At the moment, it's the seltzers um, and uh, even like um, hard iced tea and that sort of thing. Hard ciders; yeah. those are getting really popular. So, can I tell you? Can I tell you a story? Uh, I don't know if I've already told you this. Can I tell you a story about how why seltzers are such a thing now? Why are they such a thing? No, you haven't told me this. Um, so my my uncle works in the alcoholic beverage industry. I right. was saying that I think there was a group of companies that did a big study in the US asking people what they are looking for in an alcoholic beverage. What what would their dream alcoholic beverage be? And they said they essentially wanted um, uh, pretty much they wanted alcoholic, uh, low calorie, alcoholic flavored mineral water. Mm. That's what they said. And that was like by far the number one kind of the few characteristics that came out on top of this study. So that's why they made seltzers. And because they just went with that study and they said, look, this is what people want. Let's give it a go. And sure enough, that was what people wanted. (laughs) Yeah. It's crazy how popular they are now. And it's gone really popular. Yeah. Yeah. Insane. And interestingly, another facet to the success, um, my uncle was telling me that because seltzer is brewed and it's not a pre-mixed drink like it's not a uh something with vodka Mm. it's like a brewed drink that somehow enables them to escape like a 20 percent tax or something like that (laughs) um which means that they're able to uh offer seltzers much cheaper than everything else um, so they undercut and that's just another thing that helps seltzer become started. It seems to be like a bit of ape. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. Um, I, I cannot confirm that. I do trust my uncle, but I cannot confirm these, <laughs> these stories, but I'm, I, I imagine he has a pretty firm handle on the situation, but I thought that was really interesting yeah. because it makes total sense. It's like, Hmm, ask the people what they want, give the people what they want, make it affordable and you will make a really successful product. <laughs> yeah, it's business, business 101. <laughs> 101, yeah, exactly, exactly. Anyway, all right, should we uh, move on mm. to a little news story about uh, Instagram? Mm, yes, take us through it. Interesting. Instagram to trial a subscription model. Uh, this there is pretty, it is, subscription. There it is. There's the trend. We were just talking about it before. And actually, this is a trend in, in social media, which we'll talk about. There's Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook even. They're all kind of heading in this direction. Mm. It says here, Instagram is launching trials of a subscription service that allows users to pay for extra content from creators as social media companies battle to attract individuals who can drive traffic to their platform. Um, uh, Meta platforms uh, on Wednesday introduced the new feature in the US on a limited basis, adding that it provides another way for creators to make money off their followings on the photo sharing app. Quote, creators uh, do what they do to make a living and it's important Sorry, creators do what they do to make a living and it's important that that is predictable. Adam Mosseri, head of Instagram, said, subscriptions are one of the best ways to have predictable income streams, a way uh, that's not attached to how much reach you get in any given post, which is inevitably going to go up <laughs> over, uh, go up and down over time. It's right, a, that makes sense. A, a little bit of stability in there. Yeah, it's a fun way to frame the fact that they realize that Instagram, people on Instagram make most of their money from sponsored posts that... Fa- uh, that uh, um, Meta has True. no cut in, <laughs> so we have this. That's a, that's a good point. Here, here's a subscription model that we can take. I don't know what are they going to take from it, uh, but whatever it is, twenty percent or something. But here's yeah. a model that's stable and safe that we can get a piece of. Finally. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so it says creators will be able to offer subscribers access to exclusive Instagram stories. Um, that's the photos or video posts that disappear after 24 hours, in case you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to and exclusive uh, access to Instagram Lives, uh, in, yeah, Instagram Live real time video streaming sessions. So pricing of Instagram subscriptions range from ninety nine cents to ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents, with options in between, according to a Meta spokesperson. Mm. Very interesting. It says here Twitter uh, a few months ago launched a similar service called Super Follows that allows subscribers to pay for bonus content from their favorite creators. Twitter went public with a feature in, with the feature in September, giving creators the option to charge $2.99, $4.99, or $9.99 a month. 
Beyond this, many social media companies are also pouring money into the creator economy using financial incentives to try and entice creators to join or stay on their platforms. Mm. Uh, Snapchat, Alphabet, uh, or oh, sorry, Snapchat, YouTube, uh, TikTok have all announced investments of massive dollar figures. So there you go. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, last year Meta um, saying said they would they would pay more than a billion dollars to content creators through its apps in 2022. So they're kind of getting into the getting uh, in on this this trend, I guess. Yeah. And- I mean, YouTube was really number one. I mean, it still is number one, but YouTube really figured it out way back when, didn't they? Yeah. They yeah, were the well- people that kind of stood up and said, you know what? The best way to make a successful platform, social media, video, whatever platform, is to actually give the creators something. <laughs> if we give them a good deal, they will come. And they were, they were by far the first in this space to do that. And because, because they did that, everybody that makes videos is on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like I've never really gotten too much behind creating content on Instagram. And the, one of the main reasons why is there's just no compound effect of the content you create. I mean, you post something And no one's ever going to look at that again after like a day. Whereas if you create something on YouTube, it could be valuable for years. That could reap, you know, that could compound in the search rankings or even if it's not in the search rankings, people might just search on your channel for a, a video from a while ago and it can continue to generate you revenue and if not revenue views that compound on your other videos whereas on Instagram or or, or TikTok even it, it's i mean it's, i guess some people kind of scroll back through old photos but it's mostly just yeah. consume you got what's it's out today. like a week or two yeah so you have to post every single day maybe multiple times a day and if you stop you're not making any money anymore um, whereas the vast majority of the money i make on youtube is from well, not the vast majority, but a good chunk of it is from just old content. That's that's just continuing to get views. So evergreen, evergreen mm. content. So that's kind. Of, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 interesting, but it makes sense that they should have this kind of option um, because I think that yeah, I, I think there's obviously people who who have a lot of um, followers on on Instagram and and that go live often and could um, could benefit from that, and it makes sense for for Meta as well um, from a business perspective to, to get people away from doing as many sponsored posts um, and instead providing kind of premium content for a fee and then Meta can mm. come in and take whatever they take, 50%, 20% of it. Yeah, I think the article was saying that initially just to try and get people on board with this, get creators on board with it, I don't think- um, They'll take anything. They, I don't think they're going to take anything, well, that's but- good. In the in the next year, uh, next year I think they're going to start taking a cut of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously you you want to make it as good as possible. Try and get the network going before you actually yes. start to start to make money for yourself. Mm-hmm. But yeah, very interesting. Mm. Um, it just is so. I just wonder what all of these. Uh, I feel like now these apps are really starting to think about what they're transitioning towards. Like, what what are they? How are they going to keep changing? To, and what where are they headed? I think in like five years' time, a lot of these apps will probably look a lot different to the way they are now. Yeah, I guess you could probably say that of any time. But I'm sure if we went back five years, they all looked much different to what we see today. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like they're really starting to experiment with these different, uh, like for example, Instagram came out not long ago and said, we're no longer looking at ourselves as a photo sharing app. That's mm. always been their kind of viewpoint for, for the longest time, but uh, not anymore. And honestly, I think that uh, I think that TikTok has really driven a lot of the change, but uh, I think we're due for, we will see a lot of change in social media over the next five years. Yeah, it is fascinating because, yeah, I mean, even Snapchat and TikTok have driven a lot and even YouTube with um, Instagram TV have driven a lot of the changes in Instagram over the past mm. five years. I mean, YouTube drove the the change um, in Instagram to have Instagram TV where you could have long form video content on there, not just 15 seconds. And they even extended that 15 second video to 30 and then to a minute. Um, and Snapchat in, in, inspired... <laughs> let's say, uh, Instagram to, uh, to, to have stories. And then yeah, TikTok true. has, inst- has well led Instagram to, to create reels. Um, so all of these changes are coming from other features of other platforms that are really, really successful. So we'll kind of see, you know, where this goes, but 
I think with when it, particularly when it comes to apps that are mostly that gain popularity through young people, um, there's going to, there's always going to be something new that is simple and that is like ad free and that is kind of cool. Whereas the older platforms Mm. will slowly over time, they'll try and make more and more money. They'll put more and more ads. They'll come up with more creative ways to make people pay. And over time, they just naturally get more complex and less attractive as a social media platform. And that's, you know, we're we're seeing that play out um, across social media. So um, yeah, what the lifetime is on on some of these apps, I don't know. But um, yeah, certainly certainly TikTok has been a, a big... Um, caused a big ripple in this space because I think it's the first social media platform in a long time that has grown really, really fast. Uh, Snapchat had a go at it, but just didn't quite grasp it. TikTok, I think, is already over a billion users now. So um, they're, wow. they're really chasing Instagram and, and Facebook and YouTube. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. But there's, um, there's big promise there. There you go. I didn't know that. That's a big number. I don't know. I just made that up, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I, oh, did you? Oh, I don't sorry. know if they're actually at a billion users. I'm pretty sure they're they're pretty close. Or they would not. They will. Let's TikTok see if users. I can find yeah, you're on it as well. <laughs> We're doing the same thing. Right uh, 2020, now. they had 700 million annual users. Yeah, so you'd imagine now that it'd be. Yeah, I reckon they'd be over a million. Uh, over a billion, rather. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to imagine they'd. Anyway, they'd be there. Very interesting. One billion, 2021. There you go. There you go. You're right. All right. Should we talk about, uh, hey, guess what? Inflation. <laughs> <laughs> what do you What do you got to say? <laughs> Let me guess. Inflation's going up. No, all time low actually this time. Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. Inflation. Go, yeah. It turns out they, they were just calculating it wrong and- um, <laughs> Oh, they, 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 get, they yeah, missed yeah. a zero. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. 0.7. It wasn't 7% oh, in the US. Oh, yeah. yeah. the, the decimal place. It always yeah. gets me. Pesky Jerome. So <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, we have some inflation number out of uh, inflation numbers out of uh, the UK this time, um, which came out this week uh, and uh, it's- Similar headline to uh, to the US numbers. UK inflation hits 30-year high. So, uh, nothing too uh, different there. Um, but uh, yeah, so this week we got UK's data. Inflation hit 5.4% on a year-over-year basis, the highest since 1992. So, you know, a couple of percentage points lower than the US, but certainly well out of that, you know, 2 to 3% range that, that uh, most countries or regions are, are looking for. Uh, and yep. it's also up from 5.1%, which was set for the year-over-year data in November. So, um, still going up. Uh, and then on a month uh, on a monthly basis, so from November to December, just thirty days, uh, it was a 05 percent increase, which I believe was the same as the US's increase, yeah, it was, right? Yeah, 0.5%. Yep, you're right. Uh, and on an annualized basis, so if we assumed that monthly rate continued every month for the next 12 months, uh, that would be at six point two percent. So while the UK's inflation is actually lower than the US, the US is at seven percent, UK at five point four percent the monthly pace is actually the same. So they're kind of both converging. If you imagine that this 0.5% continued for the rest of the year, they would converge um, and both of them would be sitting at around 6%. So um, interesting to to see um, that coming out of the the UK, nothing kind of too much to talk about. Um, just some more, just another data point of, of uh, rising inflation. And it's, it's a good idea to watch the US, I think, because it kind of sets the tone for the world economy. Um, mm. You know, everything kind of ripples out from the US and, and, and with um, the US dollar being the, the world's currency, basically. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good idea to kind of see what else is happening in major regions. And um, mm. yeah, there you go. I think Australia's inflation, <laughs> actually, it's funny. <laughs> we live in Australia. I don't even know what Australia's inflation rate is. I think it's around like 4%. Yeah, between 4 and 5%, I think. Yeah, something like that. Right. So yeah, I'll, I'll quite mm. a bit lower than the, the US, but, um, but certainly, you know, still outside of that range. Um, and then in, in reaction to this, um, of course, uh, whenever we get inflation numbers, we think, okay, what's the central bank of, of this area going to do? So the UK Central Bank of England, well, last month, they raised interest rates for the first time since the pandemic. Uh, so they actually moved much earlier than the US. Um, yeah. you, you know, inflation came in last month uh, for the UK, 5.1%, and they were already moving on uh, on interest rates. So um, mm. the, the last month, they went from 0.1 to 025 so I guess even though they moved first, they were just getting back to 
where the US is now. The US is at yeah. 0.25, so they're kind of in line there. Uh, and another hike is expected uh, on the February meeting, which is on the 3rd of February. So that'll bring the official rate in the UK to somewhere between 0.4% and 0.5%. And uh, currently, economists only expect two interest rate hikes for the UK in 2022. So, um, really? even okay. they're expecting one. Two 5% hikes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're at 10%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, it's fine. We only uh, we only anticipate two hikes this year. Oh, okay. That doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> Two five percent hikes. You, you make a point though. <laughs> Imagine that. You make a point though because it's not necessarily the case that uh, everyone talks about. Oh, the US so three three interest rate hikes in twenty twenty two. But it's not out of the question that they raise rates faster than at point two five intervals. I mean, exactly, if inflation yeah. goes high, close to 10%, you could very well imagine they might do a 1% increase or a 0.5% increase. So it's not yeah. out of the question. I mean, it certainly mm. happened before. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is funny that. But That's kind of two, funny. Two rate hikes, <laughs> um, one in February, I guess, and then I guess one towards the middle of the year they're expecting. Um, but um, yeah, there you go. The only other, there you the, only go. other thing, <laughs> the only other thing I wanted to mention on um, this kind of inflation stuff was uh, taking a look at the ten-year U.S. Treasury bond rate is something else I like to watch. Uh, it's up at one point nine percent now, uh, which is up from 05 percent in twenty twenty. So, uh, interesting. It's already up four times in a year. She's going up, and um, that rate is still low, but it's starting to, I would imagine, starting to look more attractive towards investors. Mm. I mean, you, if that goes to three, four percent, stocks are offering six percent. All of a sudden, that's not too bad for a, a risk-free yeah. investment. Yeah, and that, I think that's the thing to take out of it is that is the trend. The trend is starting to go that way, and as the bond yields go up, then. You're right. The big money managers of the world go, you know what? Maybe I will take some of this money out of the market and just put it into the risk-free or ultra low risk category and, and just make a, yeah, it's try slightly less of a return, but it's not that bad. It used to be terrible, but it's not that bad anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Inflation continues. Uh, yeah, that's the story, though. They have jumped the gun. They've moved first. They're starting to raise rates. And yeah, the trend, the trend will be in that. It's really just that that story is just highlighting that the trend has begun. We're going in the other direction now. Yep. Um, so watch out. All right, should we do some Q and A? Yes, let's do it. All right. Um, so for as as we always say, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll feature it on the podcast. Then head over to uh, the most recent podcast on YouTube. And just head down to the comment section and drop us uh, drop us a comment. Ask a question. You can leave anything you want in the comments. You can any sort of news topic you want us to cover on on the on the next podcast, or or just a question. We'll chuck into Q and A. So, with that said, the first question we have, Hamish. This one's addressed to Ooh. you, Hamish. In your discounted cash flow, you don't include assets that could be converted into cash i.e. investments in companies. Why is this? For example, um, Berkshire's stock holdings. Mm, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, is this referring to kind of when you adjust your valuation to factor in the existing cash on the books? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, just, just to give a quick summary, when I do a discounted cash flow, I'm estimating future profits for the business, but I'm also considering uh, two things that the business has right now. One is cash on, the, on, on their balance sheet and debt. Um, and the, the, the logic sense. behind including cash and debt or including some kind of assets, let's say, um, in that valuation process is you can imagine, you know, if you're buying a house for $100,000 and uh, you know that uh, or you think it's worth $100,000 and you know that there's $50,000 buried in the backyard, um, then you would be willing to immediately pay $50,000 more than what you think the 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 property is worth for you in terms of future yeah. rental yield, for example. That's a really good analogy. Because I like that you're buying one. it, good. you pay 100,000. Let's say, let's say it's worth 100,000, the future cash flows of it. Then you would be willing to pay 150 because you pay 150, you run into the backyard, you dig up the 50,000 and you're out of pocket 100,000, which is the value. So that's kind of the logic behind taking into account cash. So adding cash to the price you're willing to pay and subtracting debt um, because debt you know, works the opposite way. Um, so why don't we why don't we consider other kinds of assets? For me, it really comes down to considering only assets that are where the the value on the balance sheet is what the asset is actually worth. 
So, and, and whether it can be converted into cash immediately. So that's cash, cash equivalents. I also consider investments where the, so investments in government bonds, for example, where mm. the value of those bonds is, is always what they're worth, right? There's, there's no, yes. there's no, um, there's, there's, there's no, up, there's not up for debate. Where, no ifs or buts. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas when it comes to shares, shares fluctuate massively over time and they mm. don't always reflect what those assets will be worth in the future. Um, so that's why I don't consider those things. Um, I don't consider things like inventory. I don't consider things like, um, like a, a, a property, which could also be undervalued yes. on the balance sheet or overvalued on the balance sheet. Um, I just consider things like that are very, very close to cash. Um, yeah, just extremely liquid. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? I th- I think, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, because, yeah, I think it is a case of where do you draw the line? Because what we say, like, cash is already cash. Government bonds are going to be t- very quickly turned back into cash and they are the value that they say they are worth. Um, you know, yeah, you could argue you could liquidate your share portfolio and then you'd have a certain amount of cash. But then where, where do you stop? Exactly like you say, oh, do we include what we could potentially sell our inventory for? Uh, it might take us a week or two to actually sell that inventory. We might have to discount it, but do we include that? Oh, you know, we've got this uh, big factory. Do we include that? We could sell that for this amount. So, it's like you got to draw the line somewhere. And I think you, you have to draw the line at what is it, – it, it's, it, it's kind of in, in the line on the – Uh, in the financials on the balance sheet, it's cash and cash equivalents. So, it's things that are either cash or are effectively cash. Um, So, you can include that. But yeah, I think that's about where you have to draw it. And also for for, um, for looking at the Berkshire uh, example specifically, it's like they don't want to sell their they don't see their shares in different businesses as cash as they they're not. Yes, I guess they could just sell their entire portfolio if they really wanted to. But that's not how they see it at all. They do not see their share portfolio as cash and cash equivalents. They see them as part ownership stakes and they don't want to get rid of them. So Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the the market is not efficient. So, the value of those shares in, say, Ber- even Berkshire's portfolio, they don't always reflect the value of those assets. And you would not be willing to pay more for a company simply because the price of stocks in that portfolio have gone up. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, Mm. that wouldn't apply to like, even if you just think of any company, you're not willing to pay more for it simply because the price has gone up. And that's what you would be doing if you considered the, the holdings of, of shares at its face at what they're worth at the current market um, in a portfolio. You could maybe value those shares if you had a good insight and you know maybe you can i mean i guess some people will do this with alibaba for example they'll put, try and put a value on ant group for example and add that into the valuation yeah. so you could you know make an argument for doing that but just taking the stock price of all assets at face value um would be a mistake, I think, because then if it, th- those shares are overvalued, it will lead you to overpay for the business. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. I'll, uh, I'll ask another one to you. Uh, here's sure. a question. Hey guys, I was wondering if there are any podcasts about value investing and investing news uh, in general that you two would recommend. Um, I think that there's one that actually there is one that I listen to quite frequently. It's investing news, and that is the Economist Morning Briefing, mm. and that's a really handy one because it's it's like uh, the biggest topics in finance, business, economics um, for around the world. It's it's not just uh, you know Australia specific or US specific. It just tells you what's going on, and it summarizes it in about five minutes. So I tend to listen to that one actually a lot just to keep myself up to speed with what's going on. And it also helps for content creation like YouTube side of things. If there's something that I've missed, um, then sometimes I get an idea. It's like, oh, wow, they brought up that there's something crazy going on in this country. Better talk about it or something like that. Um, in terms of other podcasts, Investing with Tom has a really good podcast, yep. um, Value Investing. Of course, he he invests pretty much the exact same how, how we do, um, Buffett-style Value Investing. Um I used to listen a lot to Invested by Phil Town and Danielle Town. Uh, that's always a, a, a reasonable listen. You can get some good value out of that. Um, but honestly, I most of my podcasts actually are not investing related mm. that I listen to. 
um, which is kind of strange, but that's just the way it worked out. But yeah, definitely the Economist morning briefing I listen to for the for the news aspect of it. What about you? Yeah, I, I actually can't say that I regularly listen to any podcast, which is kind of um, maybe that's <laughs> maybe I should say that if we're, we're running a podcast. But I I find my <laughs> I find my we, we honestly though we don't even know who our competitors are in this no. space. We've got no idea. We haven't looked into it before. I, I actually <laughs> hate podcasts. Podcasts suck. No, I'm kidding. But um, I at the moment. I, I'm just kind of reading in the morning instead of listening to a podcast. I like listening right. to, I tend to seek out rather than listening to kind of a regular um, daily podcast or a weekly podcast. I find myself seeking out interviews with CEOs for companies I'm either invested in or, or companies that I'm looking to invest in or, or I'm investigating. I, I, I okay, saw, yeah. So it's kind of long form. It's basically a podcast, but um, it's not any sort of set podcast. I'm looking for interviews with particular people. Um, and then, you know, listening to, to Monish Prabhai's Q and a sessions, basically a podcast, um, that he releases every couple of weeks. True. He hasn't yeah. released one in a while, but, um, he, uh, he usually releases one every couple of weeks. So those kinds of things is kind of what I look for when I'm looking for long form, something that I can just listen to in the background. Yeah. Interviews, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't actually, I don't actually listen to any podcasts regularly at all. So there you go. Well, as Jeremy Clarkson would say, on that bombshell, <laughs> it's time to end. <laughs> it is time. <laughs> you remember, he used to say that all the time on Top Gear. Yeah. Game. I actually watched an interesting show. I watched uh, Clarkson's Farm on Amazon Prime. I actually really <laughs> enjoyed it. Jeremy Clarkson, he, the, he owns a farm somewhere in England and the he has a farmer that just was running his farm, but the farmer retired. So, Jeremy decided that he would take over and try and do it. He's got huge amounts of land, so he had to try and actually run the farm at a profit, which was actually quite more interesting mm. than I would have anticipated. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, there you go. Check it out if you're interested. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Too bad he had to go and ruin Top Gear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. God damn. Uh, anyway. Oh, well. Anyway, that'll do us for today, mm. guys. Thanks very much for uh, for tuning in, as always. Uh, hope you got some value out of the podcast. We, we covered some good stuff today. Yeah. It was actually a pretty light on in news this week, but I think we did a good job anyway. Um, so, well done, Hamish. Clap, clap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, alrighty guys as always um, thank you very much to ShareSite for sponsoring and as well just the reminder if you wanted to leave a Q&A question for next week's podcast or probably maybe the week after that uh, just head over to the YouTube version and drop a comment but uh, thanks guys for listening that'll do us for today and we'll see you guys in the next episode see you guys